Okay, so the order of program is as follows. Okay. And we're starting with a couple of papers, then we'll take a tea break, then we'll have a couple more papers, and those who have really held on and felt absorbed with the material uh, will convene at Mayur Restaurant in Culver City as part of the program. So um, I want to invite you all to that piece of what's available this afternoon. Now, it's with great happiness I introduce our first speaker. And 1997, when he was a mere undergraduate, like the rest of you in the room, there was a course I was teaching in Religions of India, and Jeff Ashton, I still remember almost every single person in that class, and they're doing remarkable things. Do you know the actress, uh, Linda Cardellini? She was in Brokeback Mountain and all these wonderful movies. Anyway, she was in class with us that term. And many others that have gone on to do really remarkable, remarkable work in the world. And what Jeff got quite entranced with was Antonio de Nicholas's Avatar, the humanization of philosophy using the philosophical methodology of Jose Ortega y Gasset. And Jeff was also a Spanish major, as well as a <coughs> philosophy major, so he was hooked. And he not just was hooked with the philosophy, but also with the language and the thinking about language that's involved. He went off and did a master's in Sanskrit at the University of Chicago, and then discovered not really much material for forming a doctoral committee there, so he then convinced the University of Hawaii to pay him to get his PhD under the condition that he learned Thai. So he became a Thai scholar, has lived in the aggregate perhaps years in Thailand, and has also received Fulbright and other grants to return, to return to India many, many times. His projects have included a study of Kashmir Shaivism, which is a very interesting and delicate expression of Tantra philosophy. And he also has just fairly recently completed his own translation of the Sankhikarika of Ishwara Krishna. And we're blessed also that Mick Burley is with us. He published his own translation a little while ago, and I just circulated through the room um, one that we've done here locally at LMU. So we're hoping this will be the next hot text, like the Yoga Sutra, that will be newly appropriated, but in a very good way. So without further nonsense, I introduce Professor Ashton. Professor Ashton, thank you. heroes, authors of two texts that have been very formative in my own philosophical growth, particularly in recent years, Jerry Larson's study of the Sankhikarika and Mikhail Burley's study of Sankhikarika as, as well. And I think uh, Mick will be presenting tomorrow. <clears throat> and um, these really are some of my heroes, and, I, and I've spent so much time over the past few years really thoroughly studying uh, their commentaries on the Sankhya Karika, 
uh, in part because the Sankhikarika is so captivating, and also in part because their studies have been so captivating. What is so captivating about these texts is not just the answers that they provide uh, in helping us to understand some very universal human problems, uh, but also its puzzles. As a philosophy uh, professor, I'm addicted, very much addicted to puzzles. <clears throat> so please bear with me as I kind of take you through my own way of, of working through some of these philosophical puzzles. And I, and I really do think that um, this is a very philosophical text, and to understand what the text is trying to convey, you really have to do, have some appreciation of how puzzling this text is. At times, these puzzles are so, uh, are so puzzling, are so uh, paradoxical, that it seems to contradict plain common sense. Uh, but what I especially appreciate about Larson's and Burley's work is that they not only help the reader to make sense of many of these puzzles, they do so in a way that preserves much of the philosophical wonder that the text aims to provoke. And in doing so, they guide the reader along a philosophical journey that is by and large quite unlike the journeys of most Western philosophical texts. The Sankhikarika often exceeds our ability, or at least, at least my ability, to make full, uh, make full sense of it. And this is partly because <clears throat> partly because the text explores depths of the human experience that are that are simply not available to, to most of us, or at least not most of us most of the time. But it's also because it challenges many of the philosophical assumptions that we carry and that we read into texts and try to make sense of texts. <clears throat> um, so I'm indebted to Larson and Burley, not just because they have made it possible, uh, made it possible to kind of ascend, as Abhinavagupta Gupta writes, to ascend the series of stairs of discernment needed to understand the object of our study, which is the Sankhikarika, but because they have also modeled what it is to undertake a philosophical inquiry that brings you face to face with yourself. And so I, I think, again, studying a text like the Sankhikarika is equally a study of the object of study as it is an object, uh, a study of the subject of study, which is you. Now, having said that, <clears throat> having said that, I should draw attention to what follows in this ed excerpt from Abhinava Gupta. And he writes, It would, I think, be quite surprising if anybody could, by themselves, arrive at the correct conclusive view of the thing to be known, just in the first go, without any previous support. So let me first clarify, I don't pretend to provide some conclusive, um, conclusive view here. But I do acknowledge that part of my struggle with the Sankhikarika has been a struggle to identify the mismatches between Larson's and Burley's interpretations of the text and the Sankhikarika uh, in itself. Like, there's some incongruities here that I myself have had to, uh, have had to work out. And I'm not sure how well I worked this out, but nonetheless, that's the challenge. Larson's and Burley's interpretations were so compelling for me, and as they have been for many readers, in part because they appealed to philosophical frameworks that were very familiar to me. But what I realized was that my struggle was not just with the Sankhikarika, but really with myself. Uh, there were still some important incongruities between the text itself and my own map of the text. <clears throat> uh, and this was in large part, as I've hinted at now, due to the fact that leading scholars on this text have themselves be limited, been limited, as we all are, by our philosophical assumptions. Having said that, I would like to keep the conversation going about what the Sankhikarika means by offering an alternative reading of the text. And I emphasize again that while my interpretation is framed by a critique of both Larson's and Burley's work, I offer this uh, critique really as an act of devotion uh, and respect. I, I think I certainly would be uh, <clears throat> very lucky if someone were to read my works at some point in the future as, as closely as I've, I've read theirs. So let's Let's move into it. I focus my presentation upon two basic questions. First question is, what do Purusha, Mula Prakriti, and Vyata Prakriti mean? And the second question is, what does the interrelation between these three categories tell us about the ontological ground, or the ontological foundation, that is, ontology as in the question of being? Uh, what does this tell us about the ontological ground of Vyata Prakriti? Where does it come from? Where does its design come from? Standard renditions of Sankhya, and in this presentation by Sankhya I mean just the Sankhya Karika. Standard renditions of Sankhya 
impute an external realist uh, view on the text's metaphysics. And this goes for Larson's reading of the text. According to the external realist reading, the Purusha stands juxtaposed against an aboriginally unified Prakriti. This is one category, Prakriti on this view. Prakriti exists as a cosmos or a world of objects that persists external to and independent of the knowing subject, the Purusha. And it simply waits to emerge from its unmanifest material root, Mula Prakriti. What brings Vyakta Prakriti to light is Purusha. Prakriti evolves. Once Purusha shines its light upon Mula Prakriti, which stirs these three gunas into action and reveals an order of tattvas already late within Mula Prakriti. So this should, this should sound familiar, it should feel familiar, because this is the reading that uh, most of us have, have been given, uh, in, myself included. Now, as valuable as Larson's study has been for making sense of Sankhya metaphysics, there are some problems, uh, some shortcomings with this view. And, and Burley's work here is very, very informative. So the first one concerns Purusha, the first problem. Purusha is a pure, detached, witness consciousness. It is not a cognizing, world-experiencing mind, ego. It's not even a proto-rational soul that gets wrapped up in empirical affairs. And it's also not even an illuminating light that reveals the order of Prakriti. Mind, ego, cognition, even prakasha karma, this illumination, these are accounted for by the tattva of the anta karana, the inner instrument. Regarding mula prakriti, this is not fundamental matter, unconscious thingness, or an undifferentiated plenitude of being, as, as Larson takes it. Uh, and it certainly doesn't naturally evolve into a spatio temporal field of objects. For one, mula prakriti transcends space and time. It never gets objectified. It's never made manifest. This is not to say that it plays, uh, that it can't play some sort of causal role in bringing gifta prakriti into being. But this cannot be a relation of material causation. And here, I'm drawing specifically on mixed work here. As in the typical example of clay and pot. For both the cause, the clay, and the effect, the pot, they exist in space and time. And hence, we should be able to observe them as with the clay and the pot. But this is not so with Mula Prakriti and Vyakta Prakriti. We never see Mula Prakriti in itself. It never reveals itself. We only see Vyakta Prakriti, precisely because Mula Prakriti transcends spatio-temporal conditions. A second reason why Mula Prakriti cannot produce Vyakta Prakriti is because Mula Prakriti is blind, Pangu. This is given in verse 21. We'll come to this later. And it's blind both cognitively and teleologically, meaning it's not just blind in terms of it can't see or perceive, it's not consciousness, but it's also blind teleologically. Mula Prakriti does not bear intentionality, it does not bear direction, it does not bear a telos within itself. Consider that the karmas, which infuse life with its intentionality, these reside in the buddhi, not in Mula Prakriti. So the design for manifest Prakriti, Yakta Prakriti, is not already formed within Mula Prakriti, as if it simply waits to be revealed, awakened, or approved for construction. Indeed, Mula Prakriti is a creative potency that is causally necessary for the existence of Yakta Prakriti, but it is not a creative intentionality. It doesn't intend anything. Third criticism concerns Yakta Prakriti. Yakta Prakriti exists in dependence upon causal conditions not uh, that go beyond just Mula Prakriti. And one of these conditions is the presence of Purusha, which indicates that while Mula Prakriti exists necessarily and separate from the Purusha, Vyakta Prakriti does not. It is not already existing within Mula Prakriti, simply waiting to be revealed, simply waiting to be seen. Contrary to the realist view, Vyakta Prakriti cannot exist external to consciousness. Whether by consciousness we mean Purusha, this pure consciousness, or by consciousness we mean the Antakarana, right, this inner instrument. Since the inner instrument is Vyakta Prakriti itself. Now, Mikhail <clears throat> uh, Burley presents a compelling alternative reading. He argues that the Sankhya metaphysical schema presents a synchronic analysis of those conditions that are necessary for the experience of phenomenal appearances. That is, 
instead of describing the structure of a world in itself that exists out there independently of the knower and evolves diachronically, that is, evolves through time, again, independent of the knower, Burley contends that Samkhya examines just the nature of our subjective experience, wherein all of the tattvas manifest simultaneously, not consecutively. Supplementing his Kantian analysis of the Samkhya Karika with Husserlian phenomenology, and I'm sure maybe some of this is unfamiliar to you, but nonetheless this is his approach, and it's a, it's a really brilliant approach. He supplements this very Kantian interpretation of the Sankhya Karika with Husserl's transcendental phenomenology. And in doing so, he enacts an idealist term. This is not a realist reading of the text. It's an idealist reading of the text. And this helps to disclose many hidden nuances of Sankhya metaphysics. <clears throat> but, this idealist hypothesis leads to some problems of its own starting with its inability to explain exactly what Purusha and Mulakrakirti are. Of course, this is no small task. <clears throat> Nonetheless, here's my critique. First, Burley exaggerates the role of Purusha in giving rise to Vyakta Prakriti by correlating it to Kantian and Husserlian notions of a transcendental ego. Right? Now it's true that Mick does, in his study, he does occasionally state that we should not uh, draw an equivalence, a strict equivalence between these two. But nonetheless, his analysis is not consistent with this insight, and he later uh, built some arguments based off of a close correlation between the Purusha and uh, Kantian and Husserlian transcendental egos. The Purusha is so thoroughly withdrawn from experience that it is empty of not just objectual content, but the very impetus to fashion a world at all through some sort of intentional action. The transcendental ego is active. It can achieve a kind of emptiness of content, but it's never inactive. And this is the essential nature of the Purusha, inactivity. Concerning Mula Prakriti, Burley does take a step forward. He translates Mula Prakriti as fundamental productivity. But his interpretive models did not preserve this insight. The Husserlian approach ignores Mula Prakriti, leaving it empty. There's no correlative at all in Husserl's system. We can talk more about this, but I'll just leave it at that for the moment. Burley's Kantian interpretation better accommodates Mula Prakriti. It at least maintains an ontology of consciousness independent things in themselves that persist independently of any knower. But this understates the continuity of Mula Prakriti and Vyakta Prakriti. Mula Prakriti bequeaths to Vyakta Prakriti its essential guna nature and its causal creative power or its prakriti, <coughs> which Purusha lacks. As the sum of Kant's things in themselves, Mula Prakriti only, uh, would only get assigned passive, lifeless involvement in the constitution of phenomena, as if Mula Prakriti were a storehouse of unlimited uh, material standing reserves that submissively wait for an eye to fashion them into objects of value. But in fact, the, uh, the Sankhya Karika defines Mula Prakriti by its potency to generate, and less so as a potential to be passively revealed. And the third critique concerns Vyakta Prakriti. Vyakta Prakriti gets denied its alterity. It also gets denied its ontological meaning by being reduced to something that is wholly contained within the bounds of mental experience. <clears throat> but Vyakta Prakriti has an other side. Namely, its rootedness in Mula Prakriti. Recall, Vyakta Prakriti is born of Mula Prakriti and Purusha, and Mula Prakriti is other than Purusha. And Vyakta Prakriti then has this other side to it. It's not reducible to mental experience. Purusha, which is inactive, cannot be the creative realm or the source of Vyakta Prakriti's telos or design, while even the tattvas of the inner instrument are not strictly psychological. I can go into this, I can go into this later. The Sankhya Karika simply does not give indication that it positively holds, positively holds to an idealist doctrine, such as we find in Vedanta or Yogacara. So, if neither Mula Prakriti nor the Purusha can stand as the singular ground of manifest reality, then upon what does Yakta Prakriti rest? 
An alternative translation of, some, of Kartika 21 may offer some clues. Like the coming together, some yoga, of the blind and the lame, creation takes place thusly, as the calm presence of the two. In the, in, in the interest of time, I won't go into the details of um, my rationale for translating it in this way, though I'm happy to discuss this also in, in the Q&A. Uh, for now, I note that Kartika 21 highlights that creation takes place thusly, as the calm presence of Mula Prakriti and Purusha. And this Kartika also indicates that neither Mula Prakriti nor Purusha can stand as the sole basis for actual creation. Since Purusha is lame, and hence cannot generate anything, not even a thought, a feeling, a desire, a volition. And Mula Prakriti cannot procreate on its own because it's blind. Now, uh, one thing I'll note, one limitation of this diagram here is that in the top right here, this Prakriti, this should read Mula Prakriti. This is one of the things I'm trying to do. I'm trying to separate out these categories. Mula Prakriti and Vyata Prakriti. Okay. So please just, just keep this in mind. There are only two equiprimordial, primordial, um, two fundamental duets, and that's Purusha and Mula Prakriti. Not Vyata Prakriti. This is produced. You can contrast my translation with Larson's. <coughs> Yeah, as it's given here. The two are very similar. But mine emphasizes that Vyakta Prakriti manifests as the Samyoga, not from the Samyoga. This is not to deny Mula Prakriti's causally generated potency or to neglect the question of being. That is, why is there something at all and not nothing? I'm not trying to neglect these issues. But one reason for this translation is that I would like to read Sankhya Metaphysics and Mula Prakriti not so much in terms of the question of being. Again, why is there anything at all? I'm, I'm not neglecting that, but I want to subordinate that question to a different one. This question is the question of procreativity. That is, why is there procreativity instead of infertility? I won't go into this too much here since it opens a whole slew of questions, but I do think that the Sankhya Karaka is less interested in the question, how can we prove the existence of the world? And I think it's more interested in these two questions. How does a world, uh, how does a will to procreate get awakened? And the second, and this is soteriologically important, what does it mean to realize the end or telos of such a will? Something like a purusha artha. Okay, but that's a, a brief digression. Coming back to this, this slide here, I translate mula prakriti in terms of its etymological constitution. Mula <coughs> connotes root, basis, foundation, origin the bottom of something. The prefix pra, which is cognate with the English prefix pro, conveys the sense of forward, moving forth, in front, onward, projecting away. And the present participle kriti, doing, manufacturing, making, creating, derives from the verbal root krit, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And again, a brief digression, but this is similarly expressed in the cognate Latin term procreatrix. Ex uh, except in the absence of mula. We, we don't have a mula procreatrix in any kind of Latin uh, texts. Also, a second digression, I think that Sankhya's concern with prakriti or procreativity is, is directly related to its presiding concern with the problem of karma. Krich, so it's the same verbal root. Procreati, uh, creativity or prakriti and karma. From this, I take root procreativity to be a safe but also provocative translation of Mula Prakriti that may open new conceptual space for thinking through Sankhya metaphysics. The Sankhya Karnika explains manifest Prakriti in terms of sexual reproduction and life begetting alchemy. In contrast with the Purusha, which tends towards absence, withdrawal, root procreativity perpetually leans into, it leans toward presence. But it never itself arrives. It never takes empirical form. In order to become an actual cause of Vyakta Prakriti, now recall that a cause requires an effect to become a cause. A woman is not a mother unless she has a child. She's a mother, I'm sorry, she's a, a woman, but not a mother until she bears a child. Similarly, Mula Prakriti is not a cause until it bears forth a Vyakta Prakriti. And what does this require? It requires a partner. Just as a mother cannot birth a child of her own procreative potency, 
and hence requires the compresence or the sum yoga of a male partner, so too is Mula Prakriti not the only parent in the procreative process. She requires Purusha, literally man, to be present with or sum yoga. While it is true in some sense that Mula Prakriti is a cause of Vyakta Prakriti, the will to produce this particular manifest reality and not that particular manifest reality does not lie within Mula Prakriti. It resides within the Samyoga. It resides within the compresence of Mula Prakriti with this Purusha and not that Purusha. Remember, there are multiple Purushas. <clears throat> Karika 21 points to this important point when it strips Mula Prakriti down to its unseen, blind root. Mula Prakriti is simply the natural, unprocessed drive to beget, but completely lacks direction in itself. Since Mula Prakriti is not compelled by or toward anything, uh, then where does creation actually spring from? The design or direction of procreation, Prakriti, must be born of and proceed as compresence, some yoga. Neither the self-evolution of Mula Prakriti nor a field of Purusha constructed appearances, Vyakta Prakriti represents the self-manifestation of a given some yoga. It is coterminous and coextensive with Vyakta Prakriti. Purusha and Mula Prakriti, as I said earlier, these are the only two fundamental equiprimordial principles, mutually transcending categories that pre exist Vyakta Prakritis. And they continue to exist when all Vyakta Prakritis uh, are uh, passed away. <clears throat> but this is not the case with respect to the Samyoga of Mula Prakriti and the given Purusha. Just as the approximation of this witness consciousness instead of that one to Mula Prakriti is a necessary condition for the emergence of this manifest reality but not that one, so too is the A-Samyoga, the disjoining of this Purusha apart from Mula Prakriti. This is consonant with the passing away of this Vyakta Prakriti, not that Vyakta Prakriti. <clears throat> Kartika 16 lends some support to this reading, where Prakriti and Pravritti from Pravartate, these two are linked together in order to convey Prakriti as an actualized creative potency that proceeds Pravartate as a turning outwards, a Pravritti. Pravritti shares the same prefix pra, while vritti derives from the verbal root vrut, which means to take place, to happen, and also means to turn, to vrut. When prakriti takes the mode of pra vritti, that is when it's not just a crude generativity of mula prakriti, when this happens, prakriti becomes the actual happening, the actual taking place or turning forward of a calm presence that, unlike any of its foundational duads, has a design or directedness to it. And hence, Prakriti, as this turning forward, it exhibits an actual going forward, a proceeding, a turning forward, an arising, a springing, or even a striving, a self-exerting, or an acting forward. These are some latter means associated with Prakriti, an acting forward, a Prakriti. Commencing from a spontaneous point instant, perhaps this is the Mahat Udi. Commencing from a spontaneous point instant, as the first self-manifestation of this Samyoga, sorry, the design, the direction, the telos for the artha of Yatta Prakriti intensifies and exceeds itself by turning outward and toward a certain completion, perfectness, or satisfaction. And this lack, this sense of lack, that uh, Vyata Prakriti strives for is absent in Mula Prakriti. Mula Prakriti, again, it doesn't lack anything. It's just a blind, non-conscious uh, procreativity. And Purusha also lacks nothing. It doesn't strive for anything. Now, <clears throat> in what sense are Purusha and Mula Prakriti present to each other in their togetherness? Besides recognizing Samyoga as the creative intentional ground of Vyata Prakriti, which births itself through worlds of striving and self-exertion. What more can we say about this togetherness, this samyoga? And can any Western philosophical paradigms help us with these issues? At least help us more than realist and idealist paradigms have helped us. And this is where I turn to the philosopher that uh, Chris mentioned, 
uh, a moment ago. This final section responds to these questions by way of Jose Ortega y Gasset's existential phenomenology. Late in his career, Ortega viewed his existential phenomenology as encapsulated in his early dictum, I am I and my circumstance. If I cannot save it, then I cannot save myself. Ortega saw himself presenting a middle path between, at one end, the epistemology of the natural sciences, in particular biology, and this is significant, it links up with uh, the history of the study of the Sankhikarika. He's trying to strive a middle path between the epistemology of the natural sciences, which reduce life to an external phenomenon that proceeds according to fixed patterns beyond our control. And then at the other end, right, Ortega is trying to avoid the subjective idealist views of neo-Kantianism and Husserlian phenomenology, which subordinate life to the mental activities of the individual subject. So in place of either of these two extremes, Ortega develops a phenomenology that envisions the, net, uh, the ultimate I as life, with life as the first I expressed in this dictum. I, life, am I, am my circumstance. I, as life, consists in an alternation between the two poles of the I as the empirical ego and the ego's circumstance. Circumstance is understood as world, not an external world that exists independently of the subject, that's something uh, it's more like a Heideggerian notion of world, of social, of, of social others with whom the ego finds itself in reciprocal interrelation, but also in relation to whom the ego and its alter ego retain their mutual transcendence. Circumstances populated by alter egos. They exist independently of the ego, and yet we're inter we interpenetrate. Life, then, or lived reality in Ortega's existential phenomenology it becomes defined by one's feeling pulled in two directions. Feeling pulled inward into the solitude of the ego and reaching out into the horizons of the other. Now, <clears throat> on the surface, Sankhya metaphysics bears a similar dualist framework to that of Ortega, particularly when their fun fundamental uh, relata are considered in relation to each other. Both Ortega and Sankhya acknowledge multiple conscious subjects Ortega's second I and Sankhya's Purusha, and these subjects abide in compresence with an other, a circumstance populated by alter egos, or mula prakriti, and this other transcends and in some sense stands opposed to the subject. Ortega's empirical ego exists in relation with and yet juxtaposed against alter egos, other eyes, and it typically encounters circumstance as limiting its freedom, its power, and its desires. According to Sankhya, meanwhile, Purusha is characterized by its simultaneous compresence with some yoga and its ontological distinction from Mula Prakriti, whose overflowing power is often represented as pulling the self into suffering, into dukkha. Consequently, the self as identified with Ortega's second eye, or Sankhya's Purusha, tends toward retreat from the other and self-enclosure as its essential condition. I am only I not my circumstance, as it were. Ortega declares, quote, man does not appear in solitude, although his ultimate truth is solitude. While the Sankhya Kartika tells us, quote, this is Kartika 20, it is as if the indifferent one, the Purusha, is an engaged agent, though in fact, actually, the Purusha eternally abides in Kaibolya, in solitude. <clears throat> In a moment, I'll explain more about this first eye as lived reality. And of course, I want to emphasize there are important differences. These are, this is a superficial treatment of some of the similarities between these systems. Again, I'm happy to discuss this later on. <clears throat> um, but in spite of these incongruities, certainly Purusha is not an empirical ego, uh, and Mula Prakriti is not a world. Right? <clears throat> but in spite of these differences, uh, these correlated terms display enough association that reading Sankhya metaphysics through Ortega's dualism, I think it merits some more consideration. So this is what, what I'll do here in closing moments here. Let's shift the focus away from the equivalencies and incongruities between individual terms, and let's focus on the relationship between the respective pairs of duets. In a literal sense, the term samyoga means with and union, or joining, yoga. Translations such as contact and conjunction 
often employed by Larson and Burley respectively. They're not the only terms, but these are a couple of the ones employed. They capture this, this joining with, but they violate the basic dualism of the system. The Purusha and Mula Prakriti never actually touch, they never actually come into contact, right? It's like a Bollywood film. The two lovers always become presents, but they never actually touch. Now, meanwhile, in order to accommodate some yoga's fundamental role in begetting Vyakta Prakriti, I take compresence to mean a dialectical compresence. The samyoga of Purusha and Mula Prakriti involves a series of reversals and interchanges that play out through the self-manifestation of the samyoga across the manifest tapas. Transcending time, space, and teloi, neither, neither Purusha nor Mula Prakriti ever gets presented. However, through a, dialog through a dialogical exchange involving the reluctant presence of Purusha and the overflowing productivity of Mula Prakriti, the dynamic interplay of passive receptivity and creative potency unwinds. This is what manifests. Now, <clears throat> Larson appears to hint at something like this when he notes that, quote, Samkhya might be described as a kind of logos of that which appears to consciousness, end quote. But by reading external realism into Samkhya metaphysics, Larson fails to reveal anything noteworthy concerning their coming together as interplay. This is unfortunate since the translation logos could open new conceptual terrain if deployed from the hermeneutic phenomenology of someone like Heidegger, again, who's very close to Ortega. In, he in, he uh, excuse me. in Heidegger's system, logos implies discourse, making manifest, unconcealment, aletheia, or letting something be seen in its togetherness with something else. Instead, Larson's usage of logos appears to invoke the rational order of a cosmos in itself, a logical order, independent of the witnessing self, the Purusha, more along the lines of some ancient Greek usages of logos. I argue that the Sankhya Karika anticipates something more like this Heideggerian insight. Vyata Prakriti uncovers itself out of hiddenness by way of the logos or primordial synthesis structure of some yoga. And this synthesis structure is given in these various tapas that then unfold. <clears throat> Instead of turning to Heidegger's phenomenology though, I approach some yoga and Sankhya dualism through the dialectical compresence underlying Ortega's existential phenomenology, whereby Vyakta Prakriti gets understood as life or lived reality, the first I in this dictum. Vyakta Prakriti as life is reducible to neither a world of mind-independent entities that lie in waiting for our observation and analysis, nor is it reducible to the mental activity of a transcendental ego. Not unlike the Sankhya Karika, Ortega was concerned to pave a middle path between the subject-object duality of realisms and the subjectivism or solipsism of idealisms. What paved this middle path was the alchemical reaction of a discrete, passive, male consciousness and an immensely potent female other whose roots lie external to the given center of consciousness. As lived reality, Vyakta Prakriti unfolds as the logos, as it were, of the dialectical interchange between male and female, the I and its other. And I'll close with this final comment. <clears throat> Through this existential phenomenological reading, Vyakta Prakriti comes to life upon the simultaneous presence and sustained alchemical interplay between Purusha and Mula Prakriti, similar to the non-agency of oxygen and hydrogen elements in the creation of water. Neither Purusha nor Mula Prakriti exhibit any agency or any causal power in the emergence of Vyakta Prakriti. It is rather the compresency, the samyoga of the two, that occasions Vyakta Prakriti. In keeping with this line of reasoning, Vyakta Prakriti exhibits the design of the encounter between the two relata, not the telos or intentionality of either gendered element as already given prior to their calm presence. Interpreting Sankhya's Vyakta Prakriti through Ortega's phenomenology of life helps to portray this. It highlights the question of being and procreativity. That is, what does it mean to live reality? What does it mean to generate life? 
It highlights these questions as central to Sankhya metaphysics. And it articulates the perspective of reality as lived firsthand, and hence as including the empirical cognizing subject as always already in relation with a world of empirical objects. Of course, there's differences between the systems. <clears throat> um, but Ortega's analysis is nonetheless akin to that of Sankhya. For both Ortega and Sankhya Kartika and the Sankhya Kartika, reality is an ongoing dialectical procreative interplay. Uh, <clears throat> procreative interplay between two co-fundamental duets. One direction of this interchange orients the discrete subject toward the other in terms of a basic openness. A counter-movement pulls the subject away from the other into self-containment or solitude, soledad or kaibolya. Life and vyakta prakriti contain the bi-directional movement of extroversion, openness towards the other or pravriti, and introversion, withdrawal into the inwardness of the self or mi vritti, emerging in the betweenness of purusha and mula prakriti and their two-way pole, Vyakta Prakriti exhibits this interplay as a creative tension that engenders life. In these respects, the dualisms of these two systems are homologous. As with life, the structure of Vyakta Prakriti is relational, dialectical, and procreative. Thank you. distinction between Mula Prakriti and Vyakta Prakriti, mm -hmm. also known, uh, Mula also known as Avyakta, and I, so it shows that, you know, there's only small difference, the little private um, But the, the, the challenge comes from the concept of Satkarya, mm -hmm. okay, that the <coughs> effect is implied already in the cause, there's no separation between them, it's just a manifestation of something already there. Um, I would rather see Mula Prakriti as maybe something that gives the sense of a beginning to the system, but not fundamentally um, that different from Vyakta uh, Prakriti. Most of the time when you see the word Prakriti in the text, it's just Prakriti, it's not Mula or Vyakta. Mm -hmm. And you know, Prakriti is opposed to Purusha you know, under various dances. Um, but, but the, the difference between them is not emphasized typically, although, I mean, and I know it is sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, this is a very fair point. Um, can you hear me in the back? <clears throat> this, is, this is a very fair point, and, and I've given a lot of thought to this. Um, <clears throat> and I, here's my response. Um, first, I'll reiterate some comments I made earlier. I think if there is a causal relation, and I do think there is, so I want to preserve this doctrine of satkarya vada. But I think we struggle to articulate, to explain, what is the nature of this causation. I don't think it's material causation. No. Uh, I don't think it's material it's emanation. Causation. Pardon? Emanation. Parinama. And, yeah. And here's why I don't think it's emanation. Because <clears throat> there's no design, there's no structure that is being emanated. There's no intention. There's no desire being emanated from mula prakriti. What about something like the uh, Buddhist uh, conditioned origination? Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. It's more, it, it certainly is not material causation. Right. Um, I mean, at some level, it's <clears throat> final causation, I guess, with the idea of Purusharta. Yeah. But now, this is, a, this is a very interesting point. I think that Mula Prakriti itself is, it's, it is as uh, indifferent it has no impetus to produce anything in particular. It's just this raw, kind of bumbling, procreative urge. It's a blind will. Schopenhauer is a kind of notion of, of a blind will. There's no teleology there. So it's not unheard of, I think, to have a kind of procreative power that doesn't intend anything in particular. I think where that comes in is when, where the, te the telos comes in, is when there's a mixture of these elements. 
Now, this isn't to deny the causal role of Mula Prakriti. It's very much involved. But it's not exclusively re uh, involved. And, and I don't know how else you could explain uh, the role of Purusha in this. Well, as, as, as uh, Purusharta, I mean, all this is going on for the sake of Purusha, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. For the sake of pleasure and right. enlightenment of Purusha. But I don't see that as a mixture. You know, it's not. Yeah. So know. I'm not saying it's it's so much a, a mixture. Like right? they don't come into contact. Samyoga. But the proximity, the interproximity of the two, somehow births something, generates something. I also think this notion of purusha artha is often misread, because just because prakriti has a design to satisfy the urge of purusha, doesn't mean that purusha cares what Prakriti does. It's like a, a no. couple, right, no, where one partner is trying to satisfy the other, and the other is constantly withdrawing from that. So this, is a, this is a projection, I think, by Prakriti onto yeah. an image of Purusha. Purusha is imagined. It's an imaginal being, from her point of view. Well, imagination and imaginal, these are interesting categories. But we, I'd be happy to discuss this no. further. Okay, Susan. Um, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this may seem very fundamental, but I always, in the, the, the way that I see Sankhya, I don't ever see Purusha as having an urge. So when I hear the word urge uh -huh. in, in, in the same sentence as Purusha, then I become confused because I feel like Purusha is not only does Purusha not care, yeah. but I also feel like Purusha is devoid of urge. So, can you sort of help right. clarify that? Purusha doesn't have an urge. The urge comes from Mula Prakriti. But it's not an urge for anything in particular. And again, you know, what is this kind of role of Purusha? It's quasi-causal. I think we also struggle to explain this. But it's something like, I tried to point to this at the end, like when you take two elements, atoms together, there's no intentionality there within those elements. But something just happens out of that kind of chemical interchange, a chemical reaction. Something is born of that. And I think we, this is how I'm trying to think of this birth of Vyakta Prakriti. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your close attention to my work, um, among other things, uh, Jeff. I, I appreciate it. Um, my, I'll keep my question concise. I just want to hear from you again, because you, you probably said it, but I, I, I didn't quite catch it. Why do you think it's advantageous to, um, to think of Vyakta Prakriti in this sort of phrase that you're um, drawing from uh, Ortega y Gasset? Why do you think it's advantageous to um, regard Vyakta Prakriti as life rather than experience? Because I could read that phrase, I experience am the sum yoga of I, Purusha, and my circumstance. And that would make sense to me, and it would, it would sort of fit with um, my uh, interpretation that you've, you've so well summarized. Um, and so I'm not quite seeing what the advantage is in, yeah. in construing it as life rather than experience. Okay, uh, this, this is a good, very good question. I'm glad you asked. And I've given thought to this as well. There are, there are a variety of different kind of ways of uh, philosophically kind of fleshing out what does experience mean. I certainly want to avoid an Husserlian notion of experience because it it's emphasizes too much this subjectivity as producing experience in some sense. So I would definitely want to avoid that notion of experience. I've given some thought to John Dewey's notion of experience and other conceptions of experience which are, are more neutral in terms of do they, are they coming from the subject are they, and then the subject is then uh, influencing the object or vice versa. So there might be something that could be done there, at least um, in my perspective. But one reason why I like this is because I, th I think that Sankhya is, and I think many of the systems that, are, that take up Sankhya terminology, particularly many of the yoga traditions, I think they're concerned with, uh, with life and just the, 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 uh, with reality as an organism, a living organism, and how this organism continues to perpetuate itself through various rebirths. And so I think this notion of life and lived reality helps to ca capture many other terms that are really vital, vital um, that are really vital to 
uh, Sankhya and yogic terminology like birth and rebirth. Um, and again, it also captures this kind of procreative meaning of mula prakriti and vyakta prakriti. Experience could work, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't capture that as well. Okay, Lydia first, then Chris, and then I'm going to sit up here so people know they can't talk too much. <laughs> so I think this yeah. is in very layman's terms, so please excuse the reduction of this. But um, I, I've always viewed the, I, I like this interpretation of the Yaku property uh, in his life, co experience or this kind of the same thing. But, um, I've always viewed the moon property as like this holding tank of potentiality mm -hmm. and with no creation at all. Just this, you know, just of what's available for mm -hmm. property. My question is, I wonder if there's any knowingness in Purusha when there is this creation property of, um, you know, put characters to it. So like this guy saying, hey, you know, check out what's available in the property before you create something for yourself as the experience of life. Yeah. Like is there any you know, anything in Purusha that is reflective of what's happening between um the property and yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Well, I, um, I do think the Mula Prakriti is this kind of vast, infinite reservoir of something, but it's, it's not a thing. I'm trying to move away from kind of ontological terminology and more to capture more of not just the etymology, but this concern with um, action, procreative action. I think that that our getting caught up, whatever this hour is, getting caught up in procreative activity ends up becoming ultimately a cause of suffering. But understanding the nature of this procreativity is also the means. And so for that reason, it's, it's really celebrated. <laughs> and and Marzini, you've changed much of my thinking on this. It ends up really getting celebrated as the path to overcoming this attachment to procreativity. I don't think that Purusha mirrors, uh, it mirrors it in the sense of it's a passive consciousness, but I don't think it itself adds anything in terms of an intention or a telos. But the presence of Purusha, again, as it were, ends up kickstarting this creative process. But, but Purusha, I don't think, is itself invested in it. Does this answer your, your question? So you're saying no, it does not have any knowingness of availability of potentiality. Not of potentiality. There is a kind of knowingness, but it's something that you know Western philosophy really struggles to explain. We don't have a correlative category for Purusha. Good point. Okay, Chris, real quick, real quick question. Of the Do you see is this synonymous with Mula property in your whole analysis, or you? Because I didn't hear much about that, and I'm just curious how that term fits in as it appears. Afterwards. Yeah, I am taking Abhyata Prakriti, Mula Prakriti, Pradana, these All three as, as being synonymous. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I'm just curious because you are providing an exegesis of Samkhya. And I'm a, uh, my question is how much of a critique of Samkhya you are proposing in your reading of Samkhya. Because when you read Samkhya saying, I, Vyaka Prakriti, am the Samyoka of Purusha, and my circumstance of Prakriti, when I think of Samkhya, what Samkhya is actually saying is, I, Purusha, am not the Vyaka Vyakti Prakriti, neither my circumstance. Uh -huh. So is your reading actually a criticism of Samkhya rather than an exegesis? Or, or a, a critical exercise. I, I think initially I started with this um, intention, but the more that I've looked into this, I've really come to appreciate the Sankhya from, uh, from the inside out on what I think are its own terms. So it's less of a critique and more of just a, a plain exegesis. And, and I think you can play around with this maybe in other Sankhya systems. 
where you have an agent, a presiding agent. You have other Shakya systems like in the Mahabharata or the Moksha Dharma. They're more Vedantic. There is an I that presides over this dialectic. But here, I don't think so. It's more um, Vyakta Prakriti. I was really focused on trying to formulate Vyakta Prakriti itself and where this comes from. Oh, I'd love it because the women are so outnumbering the men with their enthusiasm for this conversation. So, real quick, Jatya. So, um, I see your translation, Purusha, as I and yeah. consciousness. And we you compare this consciousness to the uh, the Buddhism consciousness, which appears in the, the five aggregates? Uh, what's this consciousness compared to the Buddhism consciousness? Uh -huh. Okay. That's another great, great question. Um, well, the more that I've, again, the more that I've uh, inquired into what really is Sankhya Karika, what is the philosophy of Sankhya Karika, I think there are, there are incredible influences from Buddhism. Uh, <clears throat> I think this Purusha is very much an ownerless consciousness. And so the experience of suffering, the experience of liberation are ownerless. And I think that Sankhya is trying to provoke a kind of Buddhist-like experience or reala realization that suffering is without an owner. And so, too, is freedom without an owner. Except, metaphysically, they, po they posit a category for this consciousness. Uh, but when you, I think you could easily say, well, well Purusha is really just an empty, inactive consciousness, very similar to the Buddhist, I, I would agree with that. Okay, we said it. Uh, Last word. Just, uh, just one, one short question. Uh, I would like you to label your interpretation because you easily labeled uh, the previous ones. Ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> nice to, 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 to label it? Yes. Is it a materialism? No. Is it an idealism? No. Is it <laughs> an existential perspectivalism? I, I guess I would, I would call it an existential phenomenon. A phenomenology of And you are trying to avoid realism and idealism. Yeah. Both. Yeah. He's a good Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't want to be too much this way or too much that way. So. Or the Buddhist. <laughs> or the Buddhist. Yeah. Okay, I want to thank you. Thank you.